Felix Edmundovich Dzerzhinsky, father of the communist secret police, is one of the most controversial figures in the history of the Eastern Bloc. His legacy is often seen as one of sheer brutality, and in the final days of the USSR, an 11-ton statue of the police chief was one of the first Soviet symbols to be felled. However, as of 2015, 73% of Russians who had an opinion of the statue were in favor of its restoration, and in 2013, nearly half had a positive attitude towards the man himself. This begs the question, what could redeem this man in the eyes of so many? Felix Edmundovich Zerzhinsky was born on September 11, 1877, in a hamlet that lied roughly between Vilna and Minsk. He was the sixth child of a schoolteacher, Edmund Zerzhinsky, and his wife, Elena. Although his father was described as pathologically irritable and would die when Felix was only six, the boy had something that few of his future comrades would have in their own upbringings, a moderate degree of wealth. His family carried the title of Polish and Lithuanian nobility, and while noble blood far from guaranteed wealth, as in reality most titular nobles didn't benefit a penny from their hereditary status, Felix was one of the lucky few who did. He would grow up in the Dzerzhinovo Manor House, located in a forest east of Minsk, and would be educated in a gymnasium in Vilna, one of the best schools that the vast Russian Empire could offer. Knowing Yiddish, Lithuanian, and Russian along with his native Polish, he was also well versed in music and poetry, being related to the influential poet Juliusz Słowacki. The opinions of young Felix were mostly what you'd expect from a child of his background. As a Pole, he was a staunch Catholic and engaged in the time-honored tradition of hating Russia. However, at the age of 19, his worldview would change dramatically. Felix would begin participating in the Marxist underground student circles of Vilna in 1894, shortly before joining the social democracy of the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania the next year. During these early years, Dzerzhinsky built a reputation that would stick with him for life, becoming known as fiery, passionate, and fanatical, with unshakable devotion and an unbreaking stare that could disconcert anyone. Before the end of 1896, Dzerzhinsky had left behind his school and comfortable future, setting out to make a change in the world. Dzerzhinsky's first arrest would occur in the year of 1897. Caught publishing an illegal socialist newspaper in Kovno, he was sentenced to exile in the Vyatka governorate. Although he was supposed to serve three years, Dzerzhinsky escaped in just under two. In 1900, he was arrested again and sent to prison for two years, escaping before he could be sent into exile. By now, Dzerzhinsky was well known and respected among his fellow revolutionaries and was invited to the Fourth Party Congress of the Social Democracy of the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania, where he was elected to be a member of their leading committee. At this time, discontentment with the Russian government was already at an all-time high. The conditions for the average Russian remained far behind the rest of Europe, the government remained an undisguised autocracy, and the military might of Russia had been humiliated in war. As a result, a peaceful protest was staged in St. Petersburg. When the Tsar was besieged by his loyal and loving subjects for better lives, Nicholas II tactfully and wisely decided to open fire on them. This naturally upset a few people and caused nationwide demands for serious and radical reform in what would be called the Revolution of 1905. Dzerzhinsky personally led the demonstrations in Warsaw, but was arrested in July before being released in October as the Tsar caved in to demand for civil liberties. This series of events would turn him into one of the faces of the revolution. Shortly afterwards, he would organize the merging of the Social Democracy of Poland and Lithuania with the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in 1906. The men who would later become the leaders of the Soviet Union were impressed by Dzerzhinsky's devotion to the cause, and would induct him into the Central Committee of the RSDLP. After being imprisoned again in the Warsaw Citadel, then escaping to Switzerland to meet Maxim Gorky, Dzerzhinsky would be arrested for the last time and thrown into Butyrka prison, one of Russia's most highly guarded and brutal institutions. Despite having plenty of experience with escaping the law, 
The prodigiously elusive Dzerzhinsky could not even hear news from beyond his cell walls, completely cut off from the outside world. During the long years of his incarceration, he witnessed the deaths of his friends and contracted tuberculosis. In this environment of constant death, Dzerzhinsky expressed his utter disdain for the death penalty and the executions that took place in the Tsar's prisons. Regardless, the walls of Butyrka would surround him for the following years, keeping him unaware of when, if ever, he was to leave. <laughs> Dzerzhinsky was freed after five long years in jail when the Romanovs were overthrown in the February Revolution. Immediately after his release, Dzerzhinsky, still in his prison uniform, declared that the revolution was not yet complete and decided to join the ranks of the Bolshevik faction soon after. He did not wait long to begin proving his worth. Rising quickly into the highest spheres of influence, he became one of the most vocal enemies of the provisional government, which he believed was controlled by the bourgeoisie, and he was at the center of the organization of a second Bolshevik revolution. In November of 1917, Felix's plans to overthrow the provisional government were at last realized. Bolsheviks seized control of the government and changed Russia from a dysfunctional republic to a fledgling communist state. The new regime did not have immediate control over the country though. The White Army rose in opposition to the Bolsheviks, as did various other groups seizing the opportunities presented by the chaos extending from the front lines of fighting all the way to the capital. Oh my god, there are a lot of you. <laughs> With the nation plunged into chaos and civil war, the Bolsheviks needed to solidify their control against counter-revolutionaries inside their controlled territory. For this purpose, the Sovnarkom established the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, often abbreviated with the letters Cheka. When the decree mandating its creation was issued by Lenin, it was purposed to persecute and break up all acts of counter-revolution and sabotage, but its powers were limited to the ability to conduct preliminary investigation only. Dzerzhinsky was immediately appointed to serve as the head of this new organization. When its organization was decreed by Lenin, the Cheka was meant to be a contained entity with powers limited to suit its primary task of investigation, but this would be changed as the necessity for a more powerful institution began to show itself. In July of 1918, a left-wing branch of the government called the Social Revolutionaries attempted an uprising of their own, with Dzerzhinsky himself briefly being taken hostage. The following month, the reverberations of an attempt on Lenin's life were felt across the nation. With the civil war still raging on and with increasing disarray even in the territories they controlled, the Bolsheviks soon realized that they needed a more deadly weapon to combat enemies of the state one that could operate above all existing laws with brutal efficiency. Just six days after the would-be assassination of Lenin, the Red Terror would begin as the Council of People's Commissars authorized the Cheka to establish concentration camps, conduct executions, and induct more members. And on June 15th of 1919, the Bolshevik Central Committee would issue a decree giving Dzerzhinsky and the Cheka the authority to kill without trial. The man who had once advocated so passionately for human rights didn't hesitate to exercise these new powers to their fullest extent. As his powers grew, Felix would make use of his old home, Butyrka prison. Although he made sure that its prisoners were properly fed, a great generosity during wartime, the prison soon became jam-packed with dissidents, intellectuals, and common criminals alike. The security was increased and attempts were made to further isolate its inhabitants. Felix used what he had learned from his own years there, from the very tormentors he had vehemently denounced not a decade ago, to run the prison and the Cheka as a whole. Although Dzerzhinsky was no longer a prisoner there nor anywhere else, his lifestyle stayed as one that could easily be mistaken for that of a captive. He worked constantly in every step of the Cheka's operation except for the literal pulling of the triggers. He lived off of bread and water and rarely slept, 
a work ethic that he would maintain for the rest of his life. Due to this demonstration of dedication and the efficiency that resulted from it, he was regularly entrusted with Lenin's most difficult tasks, with the leader having full faith that any matter was within Dzerzhinsky's capabilities. As the civil war was ending and Russia was coming closer to stability, Stalin and Orjanikidze saw that Dzerzhinsky's health was worsening from his intense lifestyle. They decided to send him, along with other Politburo members, off on a health vacation to the Caucasus. In 1922, with the nation slowly creeping out of the revolutionary, counter-revolutionary, and counter-counter-revolutionary chaos of the Civil War, the Cheka was replaced with the more tame State Political Directorate, abbreviated as the GPU. Dzerzhinsky remained in charge of this new organization, but despite its more balanced powers, he remained, in practice, just as powerful as before. However, despite his stay at Lakoba's resorts, the influence of Dzerzhinsky's organization had all come at the expense of his health. By 1923, Dzerzhinsky was suffering from a heart condition, malnutrition, and the tuberculosis that had stuck with him since his stay in the Tsar's prisons. Nevertheless, this didn't stop Iron Felix from continuing his suicidal work habits, nor from playing a crucial part in Stalin's rise to power. He was instrumental in keeping Stalin's most famous rival, Leon Trotsky, out of action while Uncle Joseph was growing his influence over Lenin and the party. After Lenin suffered a debilitating stroke in 1923, the Bolsheviks could see that his days were numbered. Meanwhile, Trotsky, who had been experiencing some health problems of his own at the time, had been booted to the same health resort that Dzerzhinsky had been sent to earlier. While the power struggle around the inheritance of Lenin's mantle intensified, Dzerzhinsky made sure that Trotsky was kept in the dark while in his de facto exile so he couldn't interfere with the transfer of power. At this point, Dzerzhinsky was a solid member of Team Stalin and continued to be one of the most valuable assets available to the future dictator. Already the Commissar for Internal Affairs and the Commissar of Transportation, Dzerzhinsky was named as the head of the Supreme Council of the Economy in 1924, in effect giving him near full control over the nation's fiscal matters in an attempt to consolidate more power into Stalin's camp. He was also put in charge of managing orphans and the homeless, a massive undertaking in a nation that had just gone through two revolutions and two wars. He was chosen for these jobs for a reason. Despite the sheer multitude of his responsibilities, Dzerzhinsky proved himself to be extremely effective at all of his jobs, managing to revive the nation's heavily damaged economy, resurrecting the metallurgical industry, and administering the construction of countless orphanages. It can be argued that during this power struggle, Dzerzhinsky did not side with Stalin as a cynical political speculator aiming to expand his power. A true fanatic of communism and the revolution, he had always shown that his beliefs were not something that he would compromise on, and he wasn't afraid to ideologically butt heads with his political allies, including Rykov, Kamenev, and Bukharin, who Stalin was aligned with for the time being. He also had a true hatred for corruption and abuses of power, viciously attacking the waste of oxygen named Lavrenti Beria. Dzerzhinsky's health by no means improved after the war, but starting in 1924, Iron Felix's already failing health would steadily decline even further. During a Politburo meeting on July 20th, 1926, he would collapse in the middle of a two-hour speech bashing Stalin's rivals in the left opposition, and would die soon after, most likely as a result of a heart attack or other cardiovascular condition. His ashes were buried in the Kremlin Wall Necropolis, a burial site for those considered heroes by the Soviet government. Even those who had been ideologically opposed to him during his lifetime conceded that Dzerzhinsky had been a selfless, incorruptible, iron revolutionary. It's hard to draw a conclusion on the story of Felix Edmundovitz Dzerzhinsky. Incorruptible, merciless, devoted, ruthless. There are many words that can describe him, but neither sadistic nor benevolent are terms that can be placed among them. Full of contradictions, Dzerzhinsky was brutal in his efforts to better the world and cruel in order to improve the human condition. He rose to positions of the highest importance but wasn't after power. 
He had access to the riches and resources of a nation, but lived like an ascetic. He could have slipped into bureaucratic inefficiency, but instead worked himself to death. Surrounded by men of corruption, bloodlust, and greed, Iron Felix, while far from a hero and alienated from human compassion, was honest and sought to do good for humanity. He sacrificed many lives for the sake of his revolution, and ultimately, one of them would be his own. A quote from a letter he wrote to his sister sheds light on his intentions. But you can't understand me, a soldier of the revolution, warring so that there will be no more injustice in the world. Would you want me to stand aside here? I know that the narration in this video was pretty unbearable, and believe me, I would have fired the guy if he didn't also write and edit these, but uh, it should be fixed in the next two that I've prepared, and they will be uploaded uh, relatively soon. Uh, relatively. Uh, also, don't forget to smash.